I've been arguing with one of my friends lately about CPU and GPU optimization. My friend sent me tons of NVIDIA propaganda about GPU acceleration, and I can't really agree with him. I have to admit that I'm a little bit too obsessed with CPU optimization after taking a course called Parallel and Throughput Optimized Programming last semester. But I still think spending all the days coding in JavaScript makes people's brain cells shrink. And many people have already forgotten how fast CPUs can really be. I mean, you don't need to think about CMD or even multi-threading when using Node.js as a fucking backend developer. To begin with, let's take another look at the performance comparison in this PyTorch community post. In the post, this user mentioned VGG16 is 66 times slower on a dual Xeon E5 2630v3 CPU compared to a Titan X GPU. So what is the theoretical performance difference between these two hardware? The metric we are using is floating point operations per second, or FLOPs, and we can find all the specs we need on Intel and NVIDIA's official website. Take this Xeon processor for example. It has 8 cores with a base frequency of 2.4 GHz. That is 19.2 gigacycles per second. You may assume that the computing bandwidth of a single 2630 will therefore be 19.2 gigaflops. But this processor can actually perform more than one floating point operation per cycle. Specifically, this CPU supports AVX2 instruction set extension which can process 8 floats in a single cycle. We'll talk about that later. The theoretical computational bandwidth for one of these chips will therefore be 153.6 gigaflops, and a dual CPU setup will be around 300 gigaflops in total. What about the performance for Titan X? A GTX Titan X has around 3000 CUDA cores with a base frequency of 1 GHz. Therefore, the theoretical computational bandwidth will be 2.9 teraflops. By a simple calculation, we can see that Titan X is around 9.7 times faster than a dual Xeon E5 CPU. So, what's causing the exaggerated 66 times acceleration as reported in the post? Well, in many cases, programmers often fail to optimize their algorithms on CPU the practical performance will be much slower than the theoretical one. For instance, if you are not using AVX instructions, the CPU can only process one float per cycle. And if you even fail to use multiple cores in parallel, the practical performance will be even slower. To make things more complex, we need to take the memory speed into account. Before I took the parallel optimization course, I thought CPU speed was the only thing people needed to care about. However, it is often the case that memory speed is the major reason that slows your algorithm down. According to this study conducted by the University of Virginia, CPU speed grows faster than memory speed over many years. The result is that modern computers can handle 10 to 100 cycles per memory access. We can also confirm this difference between computational and memory speed limits by calculating the memory bandwidth of the Xeon CPU we've just talked about. The specification states that the max memory bandwidth is 59 GB per second, and if each flow takes 4 bytes, this equals 14.75 gigaflops. In this case, our memory bandwidth is 10 times smaller than the computational bandwidth. Therefore, if a task requires less than 10 cycles per memory access on this CPU, we'll call it a memory bounded task. Otherwise, it will be a compute bounded task. Some of you who have taken operating system courses or other hardware related courses may think that using caches will help solve this problem. But what I'm talking about here by cycles per access actually has nothing to do with caches. Take a memory bounded vector operation, AX plus Y or XP for example. This operation takes two vectors, X and Y as inputs. If they both contain N floats, the total number of floating point operations needed is 2N, which is 1 multiply and 1 add per entry. However, 
The total memory this algorithm needs to access is also 2n floats. No matter how you cache it, those data have to be loaded from the main memory, and it is definitely bounded by the 59GB per second memory bandwidth limit. Since this CPU can perform 10 flops per access, this algorithm is always memory bounded. If you find your algorithm to be memory bounded, there's almost nothing you can do to optimize it, and some of the CPU performance is pretty much guaranteed to be wasted. So, is this why the performance difference between CPU and GPU is bigger? It's actually the opposite. Since the GPU memory bandwidth is usually only a few times larger than the CPU memory bandwidth, implementing a memory bounded task on GPU won't make it a lot faster. Let's still take the GTX Titan X for example. The memory bandwidth is 336 gigabytes per second, which is 5.6 times faster than the CPU. And since a memory bounded task won't be converted into a compute bounded task on GPU, an XP will still only be 5.6 times faster when implemented on GPU. To really understand the most difficult part of optimizing algorithms on CPU, we need to take a deeper look at the compute bounded tasks. As mentioned before, an algorithm can be compute bounded if the number of cycles per access exceeds the computation to memory bandwidth ratio. A classic example is the general matrix matrix multiplication operation, or GEM. A GEM takes two matrices A and B as inputs. We will assume they are both n by n matrices for simplicity. Each output entry Cij equals to the multiplication between Aik and Bkj for k from 0 to n. This calculation takes n float multiplications, and there are n squared entries we need to calculate. The computational bandwidth of the entire algorithm will therefore be O n cubed. The total memory complexity, however, is O n squared. So, theoretically, no matter how powerful your CPU is, this algorithm will eventually become compute bounded given a large n. Most compute bounded algorithms can be optimized in two major ways, multi-threading and SIMD. Multi-threading allows you to use multiple cores on your CPU to run the algorithm in parallel. It's relatively easy for most compute bounded algorithms to support this feature. All you have to do is find the part in your algorithm that can be paralleled, divided, and schedule them to different threads. This technique is also known as the fork drawing model. Since all the CPU cores are mostly independent of each other, the biggest issue that can slow you down is false sharing, which only occurs if multiple cores try to access the same cache line on the shared cache. It's also pretty easy to solve this problem. Just don't make the private data of different threads on the same cache line. SIMD, on the other way, is not that easy to use. The name stands for Single Instruction Multiple Data, which helps you accelerate further within a single core. To make it happen, you must load multiple data into a single SIMD register. And boom, all the calculations will be done in a single cycle. It's not hard to imagine that this will be extremely easy if your data already lies continuously in the memory. On the contrary, if they are randomly spread across the RAM, fetching them and then load into the register may be even more expensive than doing it without SIMD. Some details can also influence the SIMD performance. For example, if your data is cache line aligned, it may be possible to load it faster. But this varies from different architectures, so I won't discuss it further. It's already difficult to parallel on the CPU, but it even gets harder when we consider the memory again. Take the gem for example. I've just said that it's compute bounded, but for the simplest implementation, it's actually still memory bounded. Remember this. If your algorithm is compute bounded theoretically, but memory bounded in practice, you are in a really bad situation. Let's take a look at the code. Although matrices A and B only contains 2n square floats, the total number of memory access is still 2n cube. If each access has to fetch the data all the way down to the main memory, 
it will be extremely slow. The solution is, you guess it, using cache. In fact, the cache hit rate determines whether your program is compute bounded or memory bounded in this particular case. And optimizing the cache is the most difficult and most important part of high throughput programming. For Jam, you can do a few tricks to make it faster. For example, transposing one of the matrices from row major to column major will help increase the cache line utilization. The counterintuitive part of it is it actually requires you to do more computation with this method. But because the computational cost is much cheaper than the memory cost, the performance increase from the higher cache hit rate outperforms the extra computation for the CPU. There are some even crazier techniques, including adding a few more nasty loops to break the algorithm into blocks. I'll make another whole video discussing the details of these genius algorithms. When I first learned those stuff in the course, it literally blew my mind. But for this video, we've already covered most of the reasons that slows your algorithm down on CPU. I hope you parallel well and see you in the next one.